Hello, I'm Jennifer Fields from AOL Health, and I'm here at the White House with the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Michelle Obama. She invited us to her office today to talk about her anti-childhood obesity campaign, Let's Move. The campaign comes in response to some startling statistics about children today. Nearly one-third of our young people are obese, which means they're at a greater risk for diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. Let's Move calls on the entire nation to help turn things around. All week, AOL has been taking your questions to find out what you would like to ask Mrs. Obama about her initiative. We heard from thousands of people across the country, but if you're watching now and you would still like to ask a question, you can. Simply submit your questions for Mrs. Obama at the White House Facebook page. Mrs. Obama, thank Jennifer. you so much for inviting us here today. It's my pleasure. Welcome to my White House thank office. Thank you. <laughs> Your family has really been a role model for physical fitness. Can you tell us about the initiative and why you decided to create this program for the families of America? You know, this, is, uh, this issue has been um, a personal concern to me because I've got young children. And there was a point in our lives when we were probably like most families. Um, too busy parents, uh, not enough time to cook at home, uh, eating on the run. And I started to see some changes in, in my kids, uh, some pointed out by our pediatrician who uh, suggested that we might want to make some changes. And I found that with a few small changes, uh, eliminating snacks, putting more water into the diet, adding more fruits and vegetables, I saw some pretty significant changes in my children. And I thought, you know, if if I didn't understand how uh, our eating and living patterns were affecting my children and my families, I'm sure there are millions of other mothers who were in my position, and I thought that um, this would be a good opportunity as First Lady to use my plat platform to try to bring some awareness to the issue, uh, to uh, bring a national voice to it. Um, and to give some parents uh, an opportunity to get better information and learn how to how they can can help solve the problem. So, mm -hmm. it's a it's a personal issue for me. Well, let's get started with the questions submitted by the AOL audience. Our first one comes from Ron Tellis in Portland, Oregon, and it's probably one you can relate to from mm -hmm. your pre White House days. He asks, "What advice can you give parents who both work, mm -hmm. barely have time to clean their homes or cook healthy meal meals?" and have limited time for outdoor activities with our kids. Yeah. That, that is the story of uh, every other family in America. I mean, we are living in a time where we just don't have enough time. People are rushed, they're overworked, uh, overscheduled, uh, not enough resources. Uh, and as I said, this was the position that our family was in just a few years ago. But the thing that I want people to understand in this campaign is that families can make uh, small, manageable changes in their lives that can have uh, pretty significant uh, impacts. I mean, we did things like we went through our cabinet and we removed as much of the processed food. Uh, we removed sugary drinks. Um, uh, I tried to cook a meal, not every day because it's not realistic, but I tried to cook one good meal a week. I started there and then sort of built up. Um, we tried to have more uh, dinners as a family around the table, um, ensuring that my kids were drinking and filling up more on water. Um, and then really focusing on that physical activity. Uh, and you don't need to do join a gym, and your kids don't need to involve, be involved in expensive extracurricular activities. But you know, making sure that you limit TV time, that was something we did. In our house, we stopped TV during the week. And then what we found was that our kids had to find a way to keep themselves entertained, which usually required some movement. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, my husband and I, the president, he wasn't the president then, but we did things like go outside, throw a ball, turn on the radio, do a little dancing. I mean, you, you can really make some significant improvements with small changes. And I want people to think in, in those terms and not whole scale changes that are going to turn people's lives upside down because then you can't sustain it. Um, but again, we saw some significant changes uh, with some of these small steps. That's great. Now, we heard from many readers who are struggling to discuss weight with their children. Mm -hmm. One question comes from Peggy in Western North Carolina. She asks, I was a chubby child. I was very aware of this, and it embarrassed me. My parents never said anything to me, to me about being overweight. It was only when I was in high school and got teased about being fat that I decided I was going to lose weight. 
How do you empower parents to help mm -hmm. their overweight children? I'm sure they don't want to hurt their children. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have? A good, good question, Peggy. And it's, and it's a sensitive one, and it's something that we all need to be concerned with because the flip side to obesity uh, can be eating disorders, and we certainly don't want to uh, encourage um, the reverse trend. Uh, and I'm particularly sensitive to this because I have two girls. Uh, so one of the things that we try to do in our home is not really talk about weight. Um, I, I, I try to make it a point not to spend a whole lot, lot of time talking about weight or my weight for that matter. And what's important for parents, families, communities to know is that the issue, the campaign of Let's Move is not about how our kids look. This isn't you know, uh, vanity or ego. It's really about how our kids feel and it's about their health. So what I do with my girls is that I talk about their health. I talk about how important it is to eat right, what that looks like, why that's important. Um, I don't talk about exercise for the sake of losing weight. I talk about it because I, I tell them that girls should learn how to compete and run and sweat uh, and do the same things that boys do. Um, so we talk about this in terms of an overall uh, health picture. And one of the things I also try to do as a mother is not spend a whole lot of time seeing them obsess, seeing me obsess about my weight and my health. Um, my husband and I, we try to make a good, healthy lifestyle just part of what we're doing. And generally, um, our girls tend to want to model what we're doing. So they see us working out on a regular basis. They know that exercise is important. They know that my husband and I both have a sport that we love. We encourage our children to uh, pick a sport and invest in it and learn how to work at something that they're not good at. So it's all about achievement and accomp accomplishment. And we try to talk uh, little or not at all about uh, actual weight. Now, we know President Obama has a love for fast food. <laughs> so how do you encourage um, your family to really incorporate some mm -hmm. treats but also stay healthy? Yeah, our message in our household is balance. I mean, it's interesting that uh, the president has a reputation for loving fast food because I probably love it more than he does. Um, he tends to be pretty, um, uh, pretty disciplined about his diet. He doesn't like sweets. He loves vegetables. That's just sort of the natural thing that he loves. But one of the reasons why he and I uh, you know, uh, don't shy away from fast food at all is because we want our kids to know the balance, that healthy eating is about finding a healthy balance. Um, you know, it's not about saying no forever to ice cream and, uh, you know, french fries and the things people love because, again, no one could sustain that. But what we talk about is that um, those are special treats, and if you're eating well most of the time, then there's nothing wrong with having a piece of cake at the birthday party. There's nothing wrong with uh, getting your popcorn at the movie if you're eating balanced meals the majority of the time. So we just try to model uh, what we say. I think our kids are looking to us to be examples. They watch everything we do, how we move, how we talk, what we eat on our plates. If I'm telling my girls to finish their vegetables, you can guarantee they're looking over at my plate to make sure that I finished mine. Uh, so um, we are our children's best first uh, and oftentimes only role models. So our goal is to make sure that we're practicing what we preach. Our next question comes from Jane Thomas from Troy, Michigan. She asks, I'm concerned that with budget cuts, many schools are reducing or eliminating physical education time for students. Is there a way to encourage school districts to realize that fitness is essential to students' well-being? Mm -hmm. It's a good question because it's the, the challenge of finding the time and the money uh, for these types of extra, what we now consider extracurriculars is a big challenge across America. But I think the question um, begs the answer, and it's that we have to, to really make sure that our school districts, our parents, our communities understand that exercise is not an option. It's not an either-or proposition. Um, uh, we've seen in so, so many examples of schools who are doing great things uh, on the issue of health and, and fitness that 
in public schools where they don't have more money, they don't have more time, because they're making a priority, making this issue a priority, they're finding the time. They're finding a way to incorporate fitness and, and gardening and nutrition and incorporating it into the existing curriculum. And many schools, uh, like one school that we worked with, Holland, Holland's Meadow, uh, which is in Alexandria, Virginia, they're doing some great things um, uh, with uh, uh, working with parents and communities and principals and everyone uh, is on board. They understand that they're getting better academic results because their kids are moving around more. Uh, they've got a community garden uh, in their school and they're using that garden to teach their kids about fitness and incorporating those foods into the uh, daily um, the food plan. And they're seeing real uh, positive uh, results academically. So we need to know as a nation that if we want our kids to be successful academically, they need to be successful physically. And that means that you can't eliminate um, sports and activities uh, for the sake of, of testing. Uh, but we do need to do more as a nation uh, to make sure schools are sharing these models. Uh, if one school has figured how to, how, to, how to do this well with no additional resources, how do we make sure that other schools uh, uh, understand how they can structure things in their communities? Another goal of the campaign is we're trying to get more schools to uh, try to meet the U.S. Uh, Healthier Schools Challenge uh, run by the Department of Agriculture. We want to see the number of schools double over the next few years, and this means that schools that are competing to be a part of this challenge are going to find ways to increase activity, improve meals in their schools, uh, and they're going to be looking to other uh, districts uh, to find ways to do a better job at that. But we have to make this a priority in this nation. All right, we're going to take our first live question. This comes from Brianca Clemens. Speaking of physical education. Yes. Physical education is often looked at with dread by some students. Is there a way to change this? You know, I think we should talk about physical uh, activity as play, which is actually what it is. I think it's our job to make sure that this isn't a strain because the kids, our kids can get the recommended 60 minutes of, of play a day or activity a day that uh, is encouraged. Uh, by running outside playing tag. They can get it by riding a bike and jumping rope and dancing. There are you know, many ways that schools across this country are finding ways to make physical education fun. I mean, in my day, uh, folks looked forward to recess in gym. That was the highlight of the day because you were playing. You were playing kickball. So I think our goal is to make sure that we're not treating this like a task or like a, a, a penalty. Um, we just want our kids to move more, and moving doesn't mean always necessarily mean a competitive sport. It can be a game of duck, duck, goose. Uh -huh. It can be freeze tag. I mean, all of these games and activities uh, wind up giving our kids, if they're really engaged and they're having fun, they'll find themselves getting fit uh, and being healthy without even knowing it. And that's always the trick with kids, getting them to do things uh, that's good, that are good for them without them realizing it. We have another question from Jennifer Miller, a registered di dietitian in Smithsburg, Maryland. She asks a question about where we should focus our education efforts. I conduct educational programs for kids, teaching them about healthy eating, and many of them do know what they should be eating. But when I sit with them at lunch and I see their parents have packed junk food, mm -hmm. I feel like we need to put more, much more focus on educating the parents and adults in nutrition on how to feed their children. What are your thoughts on this? That's, it's a good question. I mean, for, first of all, we're dealing with an epidemic, so we've got to tackle it from a, a many different perspectives, which is one of the reasons why the Let's Move campaign has four pillars. One of them is, however, is ensuring that parents are getting more information so that they can make better choices for their, their children, things like uh, improving front of package labeling uh, so that parents don't have to squint and figure out uh, uh, big unusual words to determine whether something is healthy or not. There, there, there's more that we can do um, to make 
uh, it easier for parents to pick foods that, that make sense and that also taste good for their kids. So I think we have to do a lot of work there. Um, but I think we can do a lot of educating kids directly. Uh, and again, there are so many schools who are finding ways to incorporate nutrition education into their curriculums. Um, uh, as this uh, questioner indicated, in many schools, teachers are sitting down at the table having lunch with kids because you'll find that the best time to educate is in the moment. And if you're sitting down at the lunchroom table and you're talking about who's brought what for lunch and what a balanced lunch looks like and you're giving a little encouragement to eat the vegetable that is put into uh, the lunch or to ask children, encourage children, ask their parents to incorporate vegetables, carrots if they haven't, you know, a lot of times it's right at mealtime where teachers and uh, teachers' assistants can have that kind of impact. They can also uh, be role models themselves. If the teachers packed a healthy lunch and the t kids are seeing the teachers eating a healthy lunch, the teacher has an opportunity to talk about why did they uh, pack a sandwich with certain kinds of meat? You know, why is their dessert a piece of fruit as opposed to a piece of candy? I mean, there are so many important opportunities to engage kids uh, and to educate them. Education also depends on the age because uh, I have a daughter who's in middle school, uh, for example, and she's at the age where she's really curious about cooking. Uh, we can educate middle schoolers and high schoolers by really uh, getting them focused on how can they actually fix healthy meals because they're curious about cooking. They're looking for independence. So I know my kids' ears uh, uh, pop up when they're going to be engaged in making the healthy snack. They'll be more inclined to eat it. Um, so, you know, we have to look at different models. You can't um, treat all kids the same. Different kids, different communities, different uh, age groups require a different approach to education. But it is true, education is the key because I think we're living in a time when a lot of, a lot of people in communities don't know what healthy should look like. Um, and some people think a, a sugary drink that has the word fruit on it is actually good for you. And it may be, it may not be. It depends on what is actually in the drink. So, you know, information is key because people, I, I'm sure that most parents think that they're making the right decisions for their children, uh, only to find out that what they've been buying for lunch is full of added, added sugars and salts. And we've got to make it easier for families to do the right thing. Our next question is about accessibility of healthy foods. Mm. And it comes from Scarlett Rose Smith in Killeen, Texas. She asks, I spend a lot of time in Davis, California when my husband is deployed. In Davis, fresh and organic produce is much cheaper and easier to get. When I come home to Killeen, the only places to shop do not carry fresh organic fruit and veggies and junk food is cheaper. Are there plans to implement new laws or tax breaks for companies so we, so we could get some nice, fresh, organic, cheap food here in Killeen? Mm -hmm. well, this is the issue of food deserts um, that uh, is, uh, and, and trying to eliminate these food deserts. Food deserts are uh, areas around the country where uh, folks don't have access to a single supermarket where they can buy fresh produce. And unfortunately, 23 million Americans, 6.5 million children are currently living in food deserts in both urban and rural communities. Uh, and one of the key pillars of the Let's Move campaign is to eliminate these food deserts completely. We want to do this in seven years. Um, because again, we cannot look parents in the eye and tell them to do better. We can't give them the information, but then only to find that they don't live in an area where they can live out those expectations. If you have to get in a cab and, or ride a bus or walk for miles to get a head of lettuce to buy a salad, you know, you're just setting families up for failure. So eliminating these food deserts is going to be key to the obesity campaign. It's also a critical issue around hunger as well. Um, but again, there are models around the country. Uh, Pennsylvania is uh, an excellent example. We visited Philadelphia a few months ago, uh, Secretary Vilsack and uh, uh, the Treasury Secretary, Secretary Tim Geithner and I, we spent time in one of those communities that uh, was a food desert. Uh, it was a neighborhood uh, that hadn't had a grocery store in their community in more than 10 years. And the thing I ask people to think about is imagine that you're a child who was 10 years old today living in that community. That means that your parents 
with every good intention, would have had to struggle to get you a healthy meal, to put fruits and vegetables in your lunch. That child is 10 years old. Uh, by 10 years old, kids' uh, food, eating habits are set. Uh, a lot of their health um, statistics are set. Uh, and this is what's been going on all around uh, the country. But Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this state came together using incentives, uh, using a food financing uh, initiative that pulled together uh, public funds and matched them with private sector funds to try to encourage um, retailers and, and chains to locate in underserved communities. And through this fund in Pennsylvania, uh, they've seen 80 or more uh, new supermarkets uh, opening up in underserved communities. And the beauty is, uh, the store that we visited in uh, Philadelphia, Fresh Grocer, uh, was it, it was the it, it was the shining star in a community that is still developing. Um, they're hiring workers uh, who live in the community. The store is beautiful. The produce sections match any high uh, high priced uh, grocery store you, you'll see anywhere in the country. Uh, and that grocery store is turning a profit. Um, and it is the sort of, again, shining star of that community. So our view is that if we can do this in Philadelphia, a state that has uh, rural and urban communities, we can find ways to replicate this model. And we're looking to do that on the federal level with a healthy food financing initiative of $4 million, $400 million, uh, forgive me, that's going to be used to uh, attract private sector dollars to try to replicate this Pennsylvania model throughout uh, the, the, the nation. Uh, but eliminating food deserts is going to be key uh, to solving this epidemic uh, in our children's lifetime. Um, now we're going to take a live question. This one comes from Becky Clark. Aside from pediatricians, who else is a good resource for learning about good quality nutrition? Oh. Hey, Becky. Um, you know, everyone is a source. I think we... Uh, we have to, uh, I think pediatricians are a good source uh, because number one, uh, our doctors are well-respected members of the community. And because most families are taking their children to well-child visits, um, pediatricians can often be the first point of entry to identify whether obesity is becoming an issue by regularly measuring body mass index. As I said earlier, our pediatrician was critical in just raising the flag for my family that we were even having a problem. <laughs> because when you love your kids and you're used to seeing your kids, you think everything they do is wonderful. You think they look cute, you think everything is perfect, and you're right. Uh, but sometimes it takes a professional to uh, step in and, and show you that things may be a little bit off. And we're trying to encourage pediatricians and doctors not just to measure BMI, but to work on writing prescriptions and help families work through uh, easy, doable steps to improve health. Uh, so our doctors are key, but teachers and educators are uh, another important uh, point of contact. Our schools uh, will play a significant role, which is one of the reasons why uh, we want to see the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act um, passed in this session. This is the key piece of legislation that's going to uh, improve the quality of food in our schools, ensure that uh, school vending machines have healthy snacks. It, it can go a long way uh, to affecting the way we see food and health in, in schools. Um, uh, and we need our schools engaged. We need to make sure that Congress uh, swiftly passes what is bipartisan legislation because this is going to be an important tool for us uh, in the years to come. Uh, but we, we should view in our nation each and every one of us, um, business leaders, uh, government officials, uh, 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 athletes, all of us uh, who our children look up to can be a part of the process of ed educating our, our children about nutrition. So we all have a role to play in this. All right, we're at our last question. Oh, time flies. Time does fly. <laughs> now, let's move has a really ambitious goal of reversing childhood obesity within a generation. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we'll be in five years? What will our school lunches look like? What will mm -hmm. fitness programs look like? And how will local communities be involved? Right. 
Well, five years is still a short time for what is an ambitious goal. I mean, we, we set this as a generational goal because we didn't get here in five years or 10 years and 20. It took several generations for us to get here and we're, we're really not gonna see the change uh, for another generation. We're really targeting children born today. Um, but uh, Let's Move, uh, the Let's Move campaign is working for some shorter and midterm goals to ensure us that we're moving steadily towards that, that broader generational goal. Um, in five years, I hope uh, to see us making progress in our school lunches. I hope that we have a viable and uh, well-funded school uh, nutrition act, child nutrition act, and that we're seeing the quality go up in our schools. We're seeing, I hope that we're seeing more uh, education around nutrition going on in our schools. We want to see uh, more schools participating in community gardens and being the place where kids are going to get their first taste of fresh fruit and vegetables and understand how that grows. We want to uh, see in five years the, the rate of physical activity go up in kids. We want to see more kids walking and biking to school. We want to see that number grow by, by 50%. Um, we want to see uh, that we're making some real meaningful steps towards eliminating food deserts. Um, that we're seeing more models like Pennsylvania cropping up all over the country uh, trying to match uh, uh, government dollars and bring in more resources. Um, we want to see every major sports league in this country finding a way to invest in the health of our kids. Um, I want to see every athlete, every Olympian uh, in a school. We want to see chefs uh, connected with our schools, helping uh, our uh, very valuable lunchroom teachers uh, figure out how do we make meals healthy and affordable and tasty. Um, and we want to see better information out there. We hope to have some good uh, front of package labeling agreements worked out uh, with the FDA. We want our retailers to be doing a lot more to improve the quality of their food. We've gotten some significant uh, commitments from retailers that have committed to reducing uh, the amounts of sugar, fat, and salt in our food. So hopefully we'll have uh, a better array of foods. I hope that we're seeing more marketing uh, of healthy foods to our kids so that we, we start seeing uh, some of our partners like Disney and others uh, taking uh, a step in ensuring that we're having conversations with our kids in the venues that they love best, those Disney shows, and we're talking about nutrition. So uh, while these goals are generational, we there are things that we can see happen in five years that should give us a sense that we're moving forward. Um, but this is going to take some time, and we have to be patient because we're talking about changing habits that have been formed over generations. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but it is possible because the beauty with kids is that their habits and approaches are changed uh, faster than adults. Um, my kids adjusted to drinking more water much more quickly than I would have ever imagined. Um, their taste buds change. They, they are more receptive to vegetables. The taste of really highly sugary drinks is a little off-putting to them once they've uh, uh, been, you know, uh, drinking more natural sweet, uh, sweetened juices. So kids are malleable um, and they're also open to learn. Uh, we're the ones that stand in the way. Um, it's our changes. It's us, the grown-ups in this game, that we are going to have to step it up and make some changes on our own uh, to get our kids where we want them to be. So. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Obama, for inviting us here today. Thank you for coming, Jennifer. Sure. Check out the newly relaunched Let's Move website at letsmove.gov, and also go to aolhealth.com to find out ways that you can help in your community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>